Andrew Webster is here to tackle a Tuesday. Good morning, Webby. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Did you just have to come in early, given the amount of news that continues to fall our way? I mean, yesterday was one of those extraordinary days in rugby league news breaking. Never stops. It never Never stops this great old game of rugby league. She's a... uh, She's a story machine. Yeah, there's a fair bit going on yesterday, but uh, it always uh, always seems to be – it likes to hold off, I reckon, after the origin is decided. So the origin has been decided a game earlier than it usually does, and um, that's why we're talking about all these types of issues. It's good, good, good yeah, stuff. It's, it, good stuff. It is extraordinary, isn't it? Morning. I actually said to Tommy yesterday, it's this weird time of the year when everything starts to unfold. Contracts start to move around. Unravel. Coaches – yeah, unravel coaches if they haven't been moved on already. Those that are in the in the target um, have that target on their back. Do start to get moved on, and we've seen that with Justin Holbrook and Des Hasler coming to the Titans. But let's start with Luke Brooks to Manly, a four-year deal, so a long, long-term deal to head to Brookvale as of next year. the The marriage is going to finally be over at the West Tigers, and Luke Brooks will have a home alongside Daly Cherry Evans. Your initial thoughts when you heard about this one? I felt sorry. I'm sorry. I felt good for uh, for Luke Brooks. He has needed a change of club for about three years, I'd say. I know things are on the up there under Benji Marshall and Tim Sheens. Uh, I know that they were keen for him to stay, but if anyone was ripe for a change of scenery, it's got to be Luke Brooks. He's had to be the whipping boy of all the Tigers' ills for the last four or five years. I, I actually feel a bit sorry for him. In some respects, I think he'll be okay on one million a year. Uh, but I think it's I think it's also a great move for uh, for him to go to Manly to learn under uh, Daly Cherry Evans, who really has hit, like, I mean, he's in, in, in just a real, probably the best uh, form of his career. And that, in, that includes his first couple of seasons when he won a premiership with Manly in the first place. I just think he has matured into such... A great leader and captain and obviously a halfback that, that Luke, if he plays six, can play his natural running game. What it means for Schuster, of course, is the big question. Well, that's that's the obvious one too. So I, I know that the Seagulls yesterday were trying to deflect the conversation around where Luke Brooks was pay, uh, was pay would be playing, but I can't imagine you're going to pay that much for a player and keep him out of the number six jersey and not have that partnership with Daly Cherry Evans there. So let's lock him in at number six because it would be an extraordinary turn of events if he didn't play in the halves. This puts the ball firmly back in the court of Josh Schuster, and if we're trying to work out a further play on this one, I think Manly have said here to Josh Schuster – Get your act together, or it's time to move on, or we're going to move you to the forwards. I, I just think it's a clear play, and it's one of those domino effects, but this is a, a big call for a youngster to now have to make in the face of a big deal that's on the table, but he'd have to move back to the forwards, and I think they're giving him a right roar, which they've done before, another kick up the butt. Yeah, maybe that's part of it, but to me it just seems more... He's a natural 13. I know he wants to play six, but to me, he just looks like a natural, a natural lock um, at the back of the scrum. And that in the way that the modern game's played, he just would be working with with Cherry Evans and Brooks. Uh, would be, just as that link man would be would be fantastic. I, it's funny. I'm sitting here watching 360 on one of the monitors here in the studio, and there's Braith and Astor up there. And I remember having this conversation with Phil Gould. It'd be 20 years ago about Braith. He he was just adamant that the Braith's best position was lock as much as Braith always thought it was six. Same with uh, Josh Schuster. Like, he's a, he's a very gifted player. We've all seen that. The no-look passes. He's a... He's a ch- he's a chunky lad for uh, to be wearing the number six jumper, and I know that might be his desire, but it's a formidable uh, combination with with uh, with Cherry Evans, Brooks, and Schuster in that team on the field at the one time. That's that's a lot to like if I'm a manly supporter. Absolutely, and if Tom Trebojevic comes back into full fitness and can get a full season under his belt, Jake Trebojevic still to come back in as well. Um, they locked in or extended Tolo Collar for another three years. Jackson Polo from the Roosters signed on a three-year deal yesterday. Tommy Talau um, from the Tigers on a two-year deal, but they've let go Latu Fainu. Um, the now remains for the West Tigers, Webby, on their future mm. with their half. Which way... Do we think they're going to go there? I don't. I don't know what they're going to do, to be honest. 
Yeah. There's a bit of a halves shortage at the moment. Uh, ben Hunt's obviously going to be one that will be looking to move at the end of next year. We don't know what he's doing, but he wants to, quote, unquote, go home to Queensland. So mm. I can't see him going to the Tigers or the Bulldogs. Uh, I still think he's he's uh, he's most likely headed to the Titans. But there aren't a hell of a lot of them out there, Matthew, so it leaves, it leaves the Tigers in a bit of a hole. Yeah, it does. I'm interested to find out how that one plays. And West Tigers fans, I'm sure you've been lighting up the switchboard this morning and since this news broke yesterday. So, um, Brooks, out as of next year, who do you want to play number seven or in the halves at the West Tigers going forward under Benji Marshall as well? So hit me up on that, 0457 736 736. Now... The Ben Hunt story. Uh, yesterday denied the release request after the sit-down with club management and also incoming coach Shane Flanagan. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around off the back of the further story today, Webby, that Hunt is now happy to remain at the Dragons for the rest of 2023 and said apparently yesterday one of the first things he said, Michael Chamis reported this, was that he did not want to abandon the team mid-season and that his request for a release related to years 2024 and 2025 of his contract with the club. I've been trying to get, trying to piece all this together as to whether or not there was a request for an immediate release or not. Or does that not matter now? It seems to me to be a crucial part of this little equation that's going on. Because if it wasn't an immediate release request, then the Broncos wouldn't have been interested. Everyone else wouldn't have been interested to try and pick him up for the rest of the year. Exactly. And if it wasn't immediate release, why did Ben Hunt say after the origin, I'm not sure whether I've played my last game or not for the Dragons? Why did Ben Hunt after the game on Friday say, I'm not sure if that was my last game for the Dragons? Doesn't sound like someone who <laughs> who, who was looking to stay out for the rest of the year, does it? So I don't believe it. And it's certainly the Dragons were the ones that were confirming that it was that his management had asked for an immediate release. He may have changed his mind, Ben Hunt. Uh, when he sat, went into that meeting, he might have read the tea leaves and seen that he wasn't going to get what he wanted to get. But come on, let's just start seeing this for what it is. This is all just posturing. This is all just posturing and positioning and agitating. I've got no doubt that the story that came out in the News Corp press on Sunday about him getting a release from the Dragons and then uh, doing a short-term deal with the Broncos to the end of this year, then doing with going to the Titans, all was going to happen yesterday. I've got no doubt that that story was all part of this big dance that we have in the NRL contracting system where we just push and prod and try and get the result that we want. And that's, we've got a lot, I think we've got a lot of that to go before August 7. Yes, you get the feel that this is nowhere near completed it's the start as, of as it. much as, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I want to go to your article in the Sydney Morning Herald today and you go well and truly into the Ben Hunt scenario, but then take it further, which is what I love about what I was reading this morning. And your words here, it's not the end but the start of the dance, the silly contract cha-cha that is the NRL contracting system. So, well, you've said this morning, the solution to all of this is transfer windows. One in the middle of the year, the other two weeks after the grand final. Make hard and fast rules about clubs negotiating outside of these windows. And if clubs are caught breaching the rules, deduct points, whack them with a sizable fine. If a player agent breaches the rules, ban him for 10 years. I just heard what Andrew, Andrew Abdo, Abdo said, and we're continuing to hear this thought process that the fans don't like it and we need a better system. I can't argue with your system in the paper this morning. It's right in front of us, isn't it? It is, but the NRL's been pushing this for, oh, Matt, God, I don't know. I reckon it's the last three CBAs, definitely the last two and definitely this one that they're about to finally just can show, sky the hands, the, the NRL, and say, look, we, we, um, we won't worry about uh, trying to employ this transfer system that we're trying to bring through. Because the RLPA don't see merit in it. Because it's of no benefit to players, apparently. Um, I would have thought all this speculation around players' futures and around uh, around what a club roster is going to look like uh, and what it means for the fans would be a high priority for every stakeholder in the game, including the RLPA. But Clint Newton and the, and the Players' Union just will not budge on it at all. They think it's a restraint of trade, just like they think the salary caps are a restraint of trade. They don't want to move any sort of uh, period. They think this whole situation where we're 
Got players like Luke Brooks negotiating deals six months in advance. Usually it's over a year in advance because of the, uh, the contracts, contracting rules. They all think, seem to think it's a great system. Um, they're the only ones. So I don't know why they wouldn't even try to budge on some of this stuff because they kept, remember they kept say, telling us the RLPA throughout the whole CBA stuff around Christmas, we're all about the fans. What a load of rubbish. You're all about yourselves. If we had a transfer window right now, so as you say, one in the middle of the year, let, let's call it right now. How much would it clear up all of the murkiness and speculation and lines and subterfuge and secret negotiation and, as you say, clandestine deals that are, that are going on? That's fine. It, look, it's not, you're not, as I wrote, you're not going to clean all that up, but you need to try and have some structure in it because at the moment it's just completely basically unfettered. You know, I, I know that the NRL are looking at, like, you just can't even negotiate with them until that period. You just cannot talk to, to another player until that transfer window or, like, and look, but the, every sporting competition around the world has all these, like, all these restraints. But that's, that's, and while, as I said, this are not going to stop the secret conversations, but God, you need a better structure than this one, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I, I think 100%. And... Like I say, we, we continually talk about the fact that this structure, whatever it is, doesn't work, yet I, I don't know why we just don't go straight to the answer, which is in black and white right there in front of us, as you mm. pointed out this morning. We've spoken about it ad nauseum, so why don't we go there? And as you say, I know the, why, the because the RLPA the won't RLPA. do it. They won't do yeah. it. They won't. As I said, they've been the NRL's been trying to force this through for the last two CBAs. I sit there and talk to Andrew Abdo about all his frustrations with it, and I go, mate, it's like I'm talking to Todd Greenberg five years ago because he went through all the same thing, you know. But this is this is what this is the madness of the game, though I reckon, Matt, because this is one thing that the fans can't cop with just this sort of unregulated movement of players between clubs one year, two years in advance. Meanwhile, we're worried about games in Vegas and we're worried about, you know, all these other superfluous stuff. Why don't you handle the things like the actual transfer market in your game? I would have thought that that was on the top of your, your list of priorities, not some other some of the other jibber they talk about. Oh, let's get forward pass technology, to put a microchip in the ball. Sort out your bloody transfer <laughs> system first. How's that one? <laughs> oh, let's let's talk about forward passes a little bit later because oh, guess good. what? Let's forward, great. <laughs> guess what? That forward pass in origin was a forward pass. No kidding, Sherlock. Um, CBA. Just before the break, do I dare ask where the CBA is at? I think it's going. I think it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> but I think they've they've said the transfer markets, the transfer system. They've been arguing about. They're about to go. It's okay. We're too hard. Let's not worry about it. So, yeah. Okay. I'll be okay. I'm not losing sleep over the CBA not getting done, Matt. No, I don't. I'm sure think the so, but... I'm sure the punters on the hill don't really care about. It. Oh <laughs> my god, what are they? What's going on with the CBA? Yeah, yeah. I've, everybody's waking up thinking that that's the first thing that they're thinking about now. Oh, oh no! Oh no! The NRL players are only on a media uh, an average wage of three hundred and fifty thousand. How are they going to get by? 